Can you tell if someone is guilty or innocent over the phone? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to analyze the staircase Michael Peterson 911 call to determine if we believe Michael Peterson is innocent or guilty. But before we analyze that call, I want to play another 911 call for you so you have something to compare it to. So this case is lesser known, so you shouldn't know if this caller is innocent or guilty going into it. So you'll go into it with fresh eyes, unlike all the baggage people carry with about the staircase, because there's been so many documentaries and Netflix series about it. So the caller here, just like Michael Peterson, comes to his house to find his wife uh, bleeding and bloody, and he calls 911. So with that said, let's listen. We'll analyze this, and then we'll look at the Peterson case to compare and contrast. 911, what's the city of your emergency? Strongsville, Ohio. We have people on the way already. What's the address? We're blazing to start. I think someone killed my wife. So both of these calls are very short, so I'm going to be pausing a lot. And here we can see that 911 asked the caller, what is his emergency? And he said, I think someone called my wife. So when people say things conclusively, for example, if he had said someone killed my wife, that could be the sign of a hoax. Unless, for example, he saw a knife in her back, right? Or a gunshot wound. But typically someone comes across a gory scene they don't know exactly what happened. When they call 911, they indicate they don't know exactly what happened. Even a gunshot wound in the head could have been murder. It could have been a suicide. It could have been an accident. You don't know. So you expect someone to say that on the 911 call because they're trying to relay as much accurate information as possible. So he says, I think someone killed my wife. That is a plus. It's a sign that this is probably not a hoax. You think someone killed your wife? Yeah, there, it looks like she has stab wounds on her back. We've so he says it looks like she has stab wounds in her back. So once again, the average person doesn't know exactly what a stab wound looks like. So if he sees slits in her shirt and blood, it looks like a stab wound. Does he know? Unless there's a knife sticking in her back, no. Right, so he already said, I think someone killed my wife. Um, I think she has stab wounds. These are all good signs that he is not hoaxing, that he's speaking from his own experience. And he's trying to relay the information as accurately as possible. That's important. We've had people trying to break in our house sir, all year. Sir, I understand, it. sir. I need to ask you questions. And then he talks about people trying to break into their house. So he has theories, right? Maybe these people who broke into their house got bold, broke in, um, but they just happened to break in at the wrong time when his wife was home and they killed her. So even though he has suspects in his mind, right, these serial break-ins, right, cat burglars or uh, unsavory people in the area, he's not taking the logical leap to say 100% that they're the ones who did it. So everything he says is hedged. And that is what we expect in a situation where you don't quite know exactly what happened. Okay, are you and uh, by the converse, if someone's supposed to know what happened and they hedge, that's a sign of deception, right? So hedging can be a sign of truthfulness in a situation where someone shouldn't know exactly what happened, like this, like a 911 call, where the husband just got home and came across a gory, bloody crime scene. But let's say a witness who's claiming to be an eyewitness of the crime hedges their statements and says, well, you know, I think he was wearing a blue shirt and, um, you know, I think I was pretty scared. That's a sign of deception because they should know uh, exactly what happened because they're claiming to know. So hedging doesn't always mean deception. It's, it's contextual. Should the person know exactly what happened, then we don't expect them to hedge. However, if they, for example, like a victim of a crime, if they hedge, that's a red flag for deceit, like um, Amber Heard, when she was talking about Johnny Depp allegedly assaulting her, she said, you know, I think he kicked a chair into me and it kind of hurt. Well, if you're the victim of a personal physical attack, attack, we do not expect you to hedge. 
Are you there right now? I just got in the door with my new son-in-law. My son was okay, here with her. Sir, what I want you to do is walk outside and say in the front. Okay, you said she's stabbed in the back? Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, if you don't, I if think you she, can start. Singing. I don't. So even the dispatcher is more conclusive than the caller. She says, she, you said she was stabbed in the back? He didn't actually say that. He said it looks like she was stabbed. So even the 911 caller is more conclusive than this caller, which is a good sign that he's probably telling the truth. Also, we should note that he is not asking for help for her, and that is because he thinks she's already dead. So if you've seen my... Um, the first video in my series on analyzing 911 calls, uh, the first one is how to analyze a kidnapping where I looked at the John Benet Ramsey case. In that video, I showed you a checklist that I've also put in the member section for how the FBI analyzes 911 calls. So in 911 calls, you expect to see certain things like a request for help for the victim or only relevant information, concern for the victim. If the victim appears already dead, then you you uh, you have to factor that in, right? If someone looks like they're dead, let's say they're decapitated or they're bleeding out, the person's not a physician, the person's freaking out, um, it is still a red flag. So we would still check the no request for help for victim in this call. But we need to factor that in as well. So just because someone fails one test on our 911 checklist, does not mean that, that they are lying. So far, this guy has not requested any help for his wife, but he is calling 911, and it appears like he's trying to relay factual information. He's trying to tell them all that he knows and know more than what he knows. I don't think she's... Her face hit the ground, and there's blood. There's a but pool of blood. see if she's breathing... No, she is not. Do you think as soon as I got start in. No. Okay, what I want you So he's conclusive that she's not breathing, he's conclusive that she's dead. That's actually a red flag. So he fails that test. Typically what you see with relatives or a mother and their child or a father and their child or um a spouses like we have here, they do not accept the reality of a death. So even if the person's laying down in a pool of blood and not breathing, um, they do not accept the death. So they say, you know, I think even he didn't accept the death fully, right? He said, I think someone killed her. But he could be accepting the death and just saying, I think about how she died. So it seems like he's already accepted her death, which is a, a checklist in the bad column, right? So it's not what we like to see. However, one or two checks in the other in the wrong column does not mean that someone is necessarily guilty or necessarily lying. But we do factor that in. So, for example, here, if you're um, listening on podcast mode, you can't see this. But um, if you're watching the video, right, you can see our checklist that I put in the member section. And innocent callers typically do not accept the victim's death. Here we have a guy accepting the victim's death, right? So he hasn't asked for help. He's accepted her death, and he's accepted her death. I want you to do is I want you to go outside. Everyone in the house, go outside and wait in the front, okay? Haley, who's in the back? Do you see anyone else in the home? My son is here. He has Down syndrome. To bust them, she sent me a text wait. to meet me at Brew Kettle at 425. I didn't hear from her. I didn't expect this. No, sir, I understand you're upset, but where's Kyle at in the home? Is He's he outside with Jeff, our son-in-law. You know, we... So notice how he says he, he gives extra information, like that she texted him and he wasn't home. And this is important. If he had started off with that information, for example, if the first words out of his mouth when he called 911 were... I was out and my wife texted me and I got home and she's dead. That would be a red flag that he's trying to build. He's trying to establish an alibi. And we saw a lot of that in the Ramsey 911 call. Um, right. So where, where they're actually talking about where they physically were in an attempt to explain that they could not have done the crime. Innocent people don't think to do that. They're very primal and the victim is their priority. 
then once they've established that emergency, then they might give extraneous information in an attempt to help and cooperate with the police. But offering extraneous information at the top of the call before giving the vital details of what they're seeing right in front of them is a red flag. It means that someone's trying to push a narrative, right? They're trying to establish the storyline in the 911 call because they know it's being recorded. Yeah, we've asked people to watch our freaking area. We- all right, so this is also important. After he does all that, right, once they've confirmed that uh, people are on the way to the house, he starts grilling the police very rudely. And some people might say, well, he's rude, so he might be a bad guy. And, you know, so maybe he did it. When in reality, when it comes to 911 calls, we expect people to be urgent and rudely demanding. So we actually expect people in an emergency not to say please or thank you or say hello when they uh, when the police answer the, the phone. Um, you know, so when the dispatcher answers the phone, you know, hello, officer. I think I found a dead body in my house. That's a red flag. Or even something as small as not using a contraction, like, hello, officer, I cannot seem to find my child. In an actual emergency, when the stress hormone is high, um, you expect them to say, I can't find my kid. I don't know where my kid is. So they use contractions. They don't use even longer versions of a word, right? So the full uh, drawn out version of the word. And I see lots of comments of people saying, well, you know, DD, I'm really polite. I always say please. I always say thank you, especially if I want the police to help me. In the heat of, a mo- of the moment, you don't know what you would do. If you can't find your kid or if you walk in your house and find your spouse um, with their blood everywhere all over the floor, you cannot anticipate what you would do. Right? These 911 call rules are empirical. So they come from studies of, of uh, hundreds of 911 calls, what people tend to do when they're innocent and what people tend to do when they're guilty. And that's why it's not always one for one. But statistically, we should expect an innocent person to have more checks in the innocent column. And we expect a guilty caller to have more check bo- checks in the guilty column. So it's an empirical science, right? It's not an exact science. But it's also not a behavioral science where... You know, um, a psychiatrist sat down one day and thought to himself, well, what would a guilty person do? Or what would an innocent person say? Right. These come from actual 911 calls. So even if you're the most polite person in the world, if you're in a, a, a an emergency where your stress hormone is high, time is of the essence, uh, you get very primal. You actually get rude. And so here, even though he's asking the police for help, Listen to how he gets frustrated and angry with them because they've allowed, they've failed. They've had break-ins, they've reported it. And now to the husband here, he believes that one of these people who broke into their house now has gone a step further and actually killed his wife. So even though he's asking for help, listen to how rude he is, which is ironically a good sign. I didn't expect this. No, sir, I understand you're upset, but where's Kyle at in the home? If he's outside with Jeff, our son-in-law. You know, we've asked people to watch our frickin' area. We've had people attempt to break in just this week. Sir, I, I don't know what's going on in this city, sir, but this is getting done here. I understand you're upset, but can you- So listen to how he's grilling them, right? I don't understand what you're doing in this city, but this is, un, you know, this is unacceptable. Also notice he's never said please, he's never said thank you. These are all, right, ironic, good signs. And the other thing about the over-politeness, which is why it's a red flag when people are very polite on a 911 call, is because A, it indicates that it's not a real emergency because they have time to think about how they're perceived, right? I want, I, I want to say thank you. I want to say please. Um, so they're still very logical. They're not in that primal emergency state. So it indicates that it might not be an actual emergency. The second thing to consider when people are very polite on a 911 call or in a situation where you wouldn't expect someone to be polite is it could be ingratiation. And ingratiation is a sign of deception because 
liars and guilty people, they know they're guilty. They know they're lying. So what they do is they try to charm the people they're lying to in an attempt to deflect any suspicion from themselves. So liars, uh, guilty people tend to be very polite when they're talking to the police because they want to be liked by the police because they know they have to persuade the police that they're innocent. Whereas innocent people, who, because they know they're innocent, the police are wasting their time, right? The police have failed them. You know, why are you over here interviewing me when the killer's out there, right? I've already told you I didn't do it. So innocent people are cooperative in that they want to eliminate themselves as suspects, right? I showed you where I was. Here's my phone. Take it. Look through the messages. I wasn't there. So they're cooperative in as far as getting themselves off the suspect list so the police can go find the real perpetrators. But they're also rude and frustrated about it because they know the police are wasting their time on them. And they have no need to persuade the police because the truth is on their side. So, so um, ingratiation is a sign of deception. The over-politeness, over-friendliness, um, you know, uh, uh, being too complimentary in a situation where you wouldn't expect it is a sign that someone might be trying to get one over on you, might be trying to charm you. It's also why I repeatedly say in my videos that virtue signaling is a red flag. It's no coincidence that of all these uh, new Me Too accusers, right, all the guys who've been accused um, at the back half of 2023 of sexual assault by women have all been very staunch Me Too advocates ever since that movement started. Right? Because they know they're guilty. They have to project the opposite because they eventually they know they're going to have to persuade people that they didn't actually sexually assault women. So in my book, virtue signaling is always a red flag, which is why I never do it, which is why I'm suspicious of people who do do it, right? But can you give me your name, please? No, you, Sir, you people drop them. Sir, can you just take a deep breath? Is there any... I haven't listened this far in this call yet, but listen to him. He's he's pissed, right? You people drop the effing ball. The whole city's getting freaking taken. If he were actually guilty, there's no way it would ever occur to him to tell the police they dropped the effing ball. He would be bending over backwards to try to get them on his side, to appear like a polite, nice, innocent guy. I'm a nice guy. I could never murder my wife. Taken over. Sir, I understand you're upset, but I need you to stay focused, okay? You don't think you can perform CPR, correct? She's in the oh. kitchen. I can't believe this. Are We've you? had a break in all your things were stolen and Sir. missing. Where she at? To, to the left. She, I, I saw this chair down. You said she's in the kitchen. All right, so now he's already said she's in the kitchen. He's not being very cooperative, which is a red flag now, right? His cooperation has expired. However, we saw at the beginning of the call, he was extremely cooperative, trying to provide all the information he knew and not information he didn't know. So if he was unsure of something, he said, I think. That's a great sign. Hoaxers. Hoaxers are people, liars, who have to push a narrative. And we have a whole playlist of hoaxers on my channel. So if you want to look at my playlist, you can find my hoaxers playlist. And one thing you'll see in common with all hoaxers is that they are very conclusive. They know things for sure that they don't actually have the evidence for. And they know that because they're trying to push a narrative. They have to sound certain about it because they need people to believe their hoax. So the fact that he's not conclusive about what happened is a great sign that he actually does not know what happened. And he's not trying to convince anyone one way or the other. Obviously, he suspects these uh, criminals broken into his house in the past are responsible, but he hasn't taken the logical leap to say for certain that they did. She is in the kitchen. What was last time Sir? I, I, I got here. We got home about three minutes ago. Okay, so he's leaving the 911 call because the police have arrived. Right, so he's done with this dispatcher now. Let's just finish out this call, then we're going to listen to the Peterson call, and you should see some stark differences. I've listened to the Peter call, Peterson call uh, a couple of times now. You said she's in the kitchen? You saw her. What's your this name? This morning, 7.30 a.m. What's your name? Like I'm her husband. 
Okay, what's your... We've, we've had people trying to break in our house. All, like. Okay, so now he's repeating his story to the officer on the scene. So I think we can end this one here. Also, just note that it's not, I did not go out and cherry pick a 911 call. So just be aware, when we compare this call to the uh, staircase 911 call, I didn't go out and pick this call because it's it's different or highlights certain lessons. I literally Googled um, 911 call husband finds wife dead. And this is one of the few calls I got where the husband was innocent. Right. So I'll just uh, reveal that this husband is innocent. If you couldn't guess it already, right? I think I revealed that pretty early on. So this is one of the few calls I could find online where the husband was innocent. Most of the calls you find are uh, guilty husbands calling in after doing something to their wife. So it, even if I wanted to cherry pick a good call, there's not many options out there. Right? You can search for yourself. In fact, if you find a good one, another one of an innocent husband, please do send it to me. You can send it through my submission form at deceptiondeck.com. So we can use that in a, in a future video if we ever want to do another comparison, like, for example, Chris Watts, if we want to compare his 911 call to an innocent husband's 911 call, we won't have to reuse this one. Okay. Also, make sure to like this video if you want me to continue this 911 call series. Uh, Whenever the videos in the series don't get a bunch of views, what happens is YouTube throttles the channel a little bit and I get fewer videos the day after, a couple days after that video comes out, which is why I've slowed down on the Amanda Knox and the John Ramsey videos. So if you do want me to do more of any of my play playlists, please do like the videos and watch them. And um, that way it goes up on my YouTube uh, stats and I can see which ones I should make a video for next. All right, all that said, let's listen to the Scott Peterson 911 call now. If you're not familiar with this case, uh, or is it Scott Peterson? Michael Peterson. The Michael Peterson 911 call. If you're not familiar with this case, this husband was allegedly outside by the pool. He comes inside and finds his wife at the bottom of their staircase. And the scene was gruesome. That's important. There was blood spatter everywhere. And from the recreations I've seen of the scene, it looks like she was laying backwards on the stairs, right? So her head and upper back were on the stairs. So she's at the base of the stairs. Her head and upper back were resting on the on the last few steps. And her, you know, her lower torso and legs were spread out on the floor. So it it didn't actually look like she you know, took a, a nosedive tumble down the stairs. She was actually, and this is important, right? So it looks like she was backwards on the stairs, right? Like someone might've pushed her back onto the stairs or she might've fallen backwards on the stairs after being shot. Um, the point is, if you were to happen across this scene, the first thought in your mind might not be that the reason she's dead is because she tumbled down the stairs, simply because of the positioning of the body. And even if the body were positioned differently, the amount of blood on the staircase was, um, uh, there's actually so much blood that I, I'm hesitating to even show a picture of it here on, on the YouTube video. So I'm not going to, but if you want context, you can Google it. Uh, so there's a lot of blood, basically the positioning, the blood to the average layperson might not indicate that someone died simply from falling down the stairs. It looked more like a murder. All right, let's listen. Durham 911, where's your emergency? Uh, 1810 Cedar Street, please. What's wrong? My wife had an accident. She's okay. So 911 asks him, asks Pearson what happened, and he says, my wife had an accident. All right, so the first things he says, my wife had an accident. That is conclusive. So this is important. Remember, in the previous 911 call we listened to, everything the, hu the innocent husband said was hedged because there's no way he could have known exactly what happened to his wife. He couldn't have known if she was murdered, um, an accident happened, 
Uh, she she shot herself and blood just appeared every you know blood splattered everywhere. The point is the innocent husband was not conclusive. Whereas Peterson is conclusive. My wife had an accident. Also note that by saying she had an accident, he's not actually telling us what happened. So if she knows she had an accident, if he knows that for a fact, which we know he didn't because he was allegedly outside, right? So if his story is true, he could not know why she fell down the stairs or even for a fact that she did fall down the stairs at this point in time. So he's conclusive that her falling down the stairs was an accident and he's not being very cooperative or helpful with the police because he's giving us the vague term accident instead of saying something like the other caller would have said in this situation, like, I think my wife fell down the stairs, which is specific, right? Which actually gives us information of how she could have gotten hurt and it hedges the uh, it hedges the statement because there's no way he could know for sure what happened. So already we see Peterson giving a very conclusive statement. My wife had an accident, which is also vague and unhelpful because an accident could be anything. She's still breathing. And then because this call is so short, just expect me to pause a lot. All right. Next up, he says she's still breathing. The word still indicates a passage of time, which is strange, right? If she's breathing, she's breathing. If she's not breathing, she's not breathing. By saying she's still breathing, this seems like a little bit of leakage that he might have been standing there and watching her for a little bit of time just to make sure that she stopped breathing because I think at this point she's probably not breathing anymore. So it is interesting that he uses the word still. She is still breathing. The only, know so, the only way to know if something is still going on is to watch it for a little bit, bit of, uh, period of time. And it also indicates a little bit of knowledge that maybe he knows at some point she's going to stop breathing. It's just like um, if I hand you a beer. Well, the beer's still cold. You know, this beer's still cold. What does that mean to you? It means that probably this beer has been sitting out for a little while. And I know it's been sitting out for a while. And I'm assuring you it's still cold because I know that it might, there's some reason why it might not still be cold and that it will soon not be cold anymore, right? So when someone hands you a beer, you don't want them to say, hey, this one's still cold. Do you want this one? You want them to say, hey, here's a cold beer, right? Or a Diet Coke, right? Because beer is lame. All right, so she's still breathing. So already we're one line in. So he's given his address. Actually, let's look at this. I just noticed this here. Look at his first line. Let's rewind the call. Listen to the first thing he says. Um, Where's your market? Oh, 1810 Cedar Street, please. His first thing he says is his address, 1810 Cedar Street, please. So does him being polite mean that he's guilty? No. Right? Please is a, an expression of politeness. It's not something we expect someone to say in an extreme situation, like happening across your wife bleeding out on the staircase. Especially when it looks like she was murdered. If I were him, if this call were true, and I'm not saying it isn't, right? I, I don't know for sure whether or not it's true. I have my reservations about it, as you can probably already tell. But the crime scene was so gory. If I were him, I might actually be worried that there's a murderer in my house right now. So the fact that he has enough presence of mind to be polite with the police, you know, please, one of the first things out of his mouth is a red flag. What's wrong? Wait, what kind of accident? She's still breathing. What kind of accident? She fell down the stairs. All right, so then she asks, what kind of accident? He says, she fell down the stairs. Once again, is there any hedging in this statement? No. Right, he didn't say, I think she fell down the stairs, or it looks like she fell down the stairs. 
He said she fell down the stairs conclusively. Remember, his story is that he was outside when this happened. So there's no way he could know for certain that she fell down the stairs. He might suspect she fell down the stairs or might think she fell down the stairs, but there's no way to be disconclusive. And as you saw in the innocent 911 call, everything he claimed was hedged because he didn't know for certain. And that's what we expect people to do. So the fact that Peterson has said conclusively she had an accident and now that she fell down the stairs is a red flag that this might be a hoax simply because of the conclusiveness. She's still being pleased. All right. So this is actually a doozy, this entire line. She fell down the stairs. So we have conclusiveness, which is a sign of a hoax. We have she's still breathing, which is a sign that some period of time has passed. You don't say still unless you know some time has passed. And in my opinion, he's saying still breathing because he knows that eventually she's going to stop breathing or he's been standing there and he knows for a fact that she has stopped breathing. But the point that he's saying still breathing reveals to us that he's been there for a little while, which he wouldn't expect if his story is true. If he just happened across this scene, he would say she's breathing. That's what we'd expect him to say. And then we have politeness. Please come. Also notice how he fails this test as well. In the 911 call, an innocent caller, we expect them to request help for the victim. Asking the police to please come is not the same as asking them to please help her or please tell me what to do or please help my please help my wife or please send an ambulance saying please come is not the same thing as a request for help if he's a hoaxer he wants the police there to start verifying his fabricated evidence and processing the crime scene so that he's one step closer to pulling off his crime Conscious? What? Is she conscious? No, she's not conscious. All right. So they ask, is she conscious? He says, what? Let's see. So when people ask questions or respond to questions with a question, it either means they didn't hear what was said, which in which case the what is appropriate, or it means that they're stalling for time to think of a response. So 901 said, is she conscious? He said, what? And then they said, is she conscious? So they repeated the question. And that might be a sign that he actually didn't hear what was said, although we can't be sure. So the fact that he replied to a question with a question could indicate to us that he's, t he's taking time to fabricate his next answer. So if he's looking at a dead body, and if he's looking at a dead body, even saying something like, even affirming that a dead body is conscious is hard to do because your brain knows it's a direct lie. So that little bit of inhibition might be him overcoming that stumbling block of suppressing what he actually knows in order to fabricate a deceptive answer, which is to say that she is conscious when she isn't. And the actual response he gives is, no, she's not conscious. So he actually parrots back the dispatcher's words, which is a common tactic of liar of liars. So for a liar, it's a lot easier to just parrot back something that is said. So for example, if I say, did you steal my cookies? A liar could much more easily say, no, I did not steal your cookies. Because they don't have to fabricate any new words. All they have to do is overcome that little hurdle of saying no and then parroting back my words. Whereas an honest person is much more likely to say something like, um, like, uh, well, any uh, liars, it's uh, actually the fault in that case is the interviewer's fault. The interviewer should s to not supply the words. So for example, if I think someone stole my cookies, 
I could say, you know, did you take anything from my, uh, you know, from my pantry closet? And then if they say, no, I did not steal your cookies, that's a sign that they're guilty. Whereas an innocent person could say, no, I, I, I didn't take anything from your closet, from your pantry. <coughs> I'm struggling to come up with a good example here. But either way, the fact that the words are parroted. For example, if he had said, no, she's still awake, right? If he had used a new word, that would be a good sign that he's telling the truth. Right, so if she said, is she still conscious? And he said, no, she seems to be moving. Or her eyes are fluttering. I think she, she's awake. Or I think she's conscious because um, you know, she moved a little bit. That would be a sign that he's telling the truth because he's supplying new vocabulary and new details. Not just parroting back what was said to him. So let me know if that makes sense. Right? The parroting back is a, is a tactic of liars to lie more easily because they don't have to fabricate any new words. All they have to do is just add the word no, and then recite what they just heard the interviewer ask. Okay. How many stairs did you what? fall down? Her? How many stairs? stairs? How many stairs? Oh, one second, let me rewind a little bit. So let's listen if he actually waited for her to repeat the question, or if it seems like he understood the question, but he just said what in order to delay. So let's see if he waits for at, to actually repeat the entire question, or if he starts answering before she finishes repeating it. Is she conscious? What? Is she conscious? No, she's not conscious. All right, so she said, is she conscious? It sounds like he said no before she even finished repeating the question. Is she conscious? What? Is she conscious? No, she's not conscious. Hmm. That's a close one. So if he said what, even though he understood the question, then he was delaying in order to overcome the hurdle of telling a lie, which would indicate that she was not conscious when he called, which indicates that he probably stood there until she stopped breathing because it means that, uh, that he's lying to the police. All right, so he says, no, she's not conscious. Okay, how many stairs did and then he says, please again. So A, please is a sign of politeness, which we don't expect to see in an emergency. Also, the please is vague. Once again, he doesn't request help for the victim. He doesn't say, please send help for my wife. Please help my wife. Please tell me what to do. Nothing like that. Just the word please. All right, so how many stairs did she fall down? Once again, we get a question. He's responding to a question with a question. Notice how earlier it seems like he was able to answer the questions more easily. So the anticipated questions, like where is your emergency? He had the address ready. What's wrong? He had his story ready. It was an accident. What kind of accident? Fell down the stairs. But once we get to unanticipated questions, he starts struggling. He has to ask her to repeat the question. And from what I see, you know, from just listening to this, you can let me know if you agree. It sounds like he's not actually waiting for the question to be repeated. He actually starts answering the second time she repeats the question, which means that he probably heard the question perfectly fine the first time. And he's ask, asking a question in order to delay so he can prepare his answer. So is she conscious? Might have been an unanticipated question for him, which is why he had to delay. And then he had to actually pare back the exact words. Now, how many stairs did she fall down? That was probably an unanticipated question. So he says, what, huh? The dispatch repeats how many stairs. He says the back stairs. So he actually goes back and forth about the stair things, uh, uh, how many stairs a couple times. Probably because it was unanticipated. Also because there's no way if he wasn't there, he should know how many stairs she fell down. He shouldn't know if she fell from the top of the staircase or if she fell from the middle of the staircase um, or if she tripped on the very last landing. 
this this staircase, if you see the pictures, has a little landing down towards the bottom. So A, he shouldn't even know if it was an accident. He shouldn't know whether or not she fell down the stairs. And he definitely shouldn't know exactly how many stairs she fell down. So I think this might be why he's struggling to answer this question because it was unanticipated and he has to decide how much should I actually know in this situation if I'm telling the truth. So let's see how he overcomes that in answers. Many stairs. Uh, oh. Calm down, sir. Uh, Calm down. No, that was 15, 20, I don't know. Please. All right, so then he takes a stab at answering 15, 20. So I'd be curious to see how many stairs are actually in that staircase for him to say that. So he's, he's taking a guess at it. And then he admits, I don't know. So a perfect answer would be, I don't know. And then maybe make a guess, right? Like in the other call where if they had asked the husband, how many times was your wife stabbed? He'd probably say, I don't know. I think three or five, you know, three to five times, right? So he would hedge his answer. Peterson, however, throws out two numbers and then admits he doesn't know. Please, get somebody here right away, please. Okay. All right, then once again, we have the politeness, please. And then get somebody here. Once again, we don't have him requesting help for his wife. And the other caller also did not request help for his wife, and he ended up being innocent. All right, so that's why we have these. Um, actually, I've modified this this FBI list. If you see in the member, if you're a member, you can look in my list. I've got four, five, six, seven, ten criteria that I use. So I've taken out some of the body language stuff from the FBI, um, some of the subjective stuff like voice modulation. I've taken that out of my list. So my, uh, uh, my um, edited list for 911 calls, I basically look at these criteria, but you can use this for any emergency. So it goes in three categories. So first I look at what is the call about? And I ask, did the, per did the caller ask for aid for the victim? And here we don't see Peterson doing that. Next I ask, do they provide relevant information or extra information. And in this case, we have extra information because we have Peterson telling us this was an accident rather than just telling us that he found his wife at the bottom of the staircase and he thinks she fell down the stairs. That would be the sign of a true caller, of an innocent caller, right? Just providing the relevant information. Peterson goes a step further to tell us that this was an accident and then even um, saying that she fell down the stairs when the crime scene really did not look like someone who fell down the stairs. I think the average person coming into that crime scene, that would not be their first thought. Their first thought would be that there's a killer in the house. Next, I look at is there a concern for the victim or is there blaming of the victim? And in this Peterson call, we can see that we have a subtle blaming of the victim when he says that she had an accident, right? So it's her fault. My wife had an accident. And then we look at, are they giving factual information or contradictory information? And from what I see here, it looks like we're getting hoax information, right? So very conclusive information that there's no way the caller could know for certain the things that he's claiming. The next thing I look at is the, is the priority of the call the victim or is the priority of the call the caller? And so far, all we have Peterson doing is asking the police to send someone and we're not being told whether he wants them sent for the victim or sent for himself. Next, we look at is the victim's survival the priority or is the caller's problem the priority? And here we see that he's not necessarily asking for any uh, help to resuscitate the victim. Uh, he's pretty certain she's dead, which is the next criteria. Does the caller deny the death or do they accept the death? 
And the last three criteria are, is the call urgent or is it calm and patient? Is the caller speaking smoothly? So just telling us facts of what we know, like the uh, other caller we listened to, where he was very urgent and angry, but also the words flowed out of his mouth easily, right? He wasn't constantly asking the police to repeat questions uh, to him. He was able to respond smoothly because he was speaking from his knowledge, from the truth, from stuff he had just seen. He didn't have to fabricate anything. Whereas we see Peterson is very self-interrupting. Right? He asks for uh, questions to be repeated. He takes stabs at things without finishing his sentences. And finally, is the caller cooperative or are they reticent? In other words, are they non-responsive, repetitive, and saying huh and what a lot? And that's exactly what we see with Peterson, that he's reticent. And also, if you're uh, watching this video, you can see my extra notes here that basically show us which of these markers are the biggest signs of guilt, uh, which are the, you know, which is the second, third, and then which is the best indicator of innocence. Somebody's dispatching the ambulance while I ask you questions. It's a forced kill, okay? Please, please. All right, and then we actually have him wrapping up the call without asking any other, without asking for help. You know, what should I do? Should I put her on her side? Or giving extra details. As you saw with the innocent caller, he stayed on the phone with the police even when the other police arrived at the door, right? He was talking to her the entire time. There was no need to cut off the conversation because he might have a slip of the tongue or because he hadn't fabricated the rest of the story and he didn't want to get into it, or because you know the caller was asking too much peripheral, unanticipated questions, so he wanted to get off quickly. So it's interesting that Peterson is the one who hung up the call, and we also saw that with the Ramseys, where Patsy Ramsey is the one who hung up on the police, not the other way around. And to me, that's a sign that someone is speaking from a scripted story, and they only prepared so much of what, they, what they're what they going to say. And they couldn't prepare everything, every single contingency. So once they get their alibi out there and their narrative out there, they hang up. So you'll notice this call is only 38 seconds long. He doesn't do anything to describe the scene. He doesn't even describe his wife. Right? He doesn't describe what she looks like, the blood, the contusions on the head. Overall, this is a very vague call. It's extremely vague except for two things, which are extremely conclusive. That she had an accident and that she fell down the stairs. And that she's still breathing. Everything else is vague, probably because those are things that he did not anticipate having to get into on this call. All right, so let me know uh, what you think. Personally, I think, Michael Peterson, this call looks deceptive. It looks like a hoax to me. It looks reticent, where you would expect great detail. And it's very conclusive, where you would expect hedging. All right, so now that you know my opinion, let's check in with the members. If you're a member of the channel, I sent this video out a month ago. And this is a great call because... There's things you can put in the innocent column and things he does that you can put in the guilty column. So it's ripe for debate. All right. So first up, we have member Meg Fabs. Meg, thank you for being a member. And she has lots of great notes here and things that we caught on the call that we just analyzed. So for example, she notes that he never actually requested help for his wife. He only asked for help in general. Also, she noticed the victim blaming in that the wife had the accident. Right, So it's a subtle victim blaming that the accident, the death, is her fault. Also, Meg notices the reticent, reticence very early on. So she noticed the second time the operator asked what's wrong, it's the second time he'd been asked and not actually answered the question. Right, He had to be asked twice before he provided any detail about what actually may have happened to his wife. 
rather than just being vague and telling us an accident. Meg is on a roll here as well because she notices it takes five questions before we find out why specifically his wife needs help. Remember, when you call 911, you're calling because you need help. Someone needs an ambulance or someone uh, needs to get there because there's a criminal in the house, right? So you're in danger. Someone's dying. Someone's having an emergency. But it takes five questions before we get to anything specific about the wife in that she's unconscious. And we never get any detail about the injuries she sustained. Whereas the innocent caller, as you saw, that's the first thing he brings up. The blood, this, the potential stab wounds, he's describing the condition because that's the emergency. I need an ambulance here because it looks like she's been stabbed. It looks like she's bleeding out. She might be dead. So it takes five questions before we get any even glimmer of information about the wife. And that's only after being prompted about her consciousness. And then Meg actually caught something that I missed on this listen. Where at, when the police confirmed that an ambulance is on the way, Peterson says, it's off of uh, Forest Hills, okay. And his use, uh, use of the word it is distancing. So she says, could it be distancing? Yes, it is. For example, he didn't say, we are off of Forest Hills. Our, our house is off of Forest Hills. Right? Our, uh, my wife is in the kitchen at Forest Hills. He says it, which is distancing himself from the scene of the crime. And also, Meg points out, is the it referring to the house or his wife? Because in emergency, you would expect him to be talking about his wife, telling them where she is. And he could very well be, this could be leakage, where he's referring to his wife as it. It is off of Forest Hills, so send an ambulance there to come collect it. Right, so the word it might not be a deliberate choice. It might be a leakage revealing his distance from her, so emotional distance, where he hasn't used her name once in this phone call. And it could also indicate that she's dead. So she's gone from being a human being with a name and an identity, a wife, a mother, a daughter, to it, a dead cadaver, and please come here to pick it up. So overall, excellent comments from Meg. And like I always say, because I'm doing these analysis on the fly or with very little prep work, you will 100% catch things that I miss. And I love it when that happens because I get the same satisfying eureka moment when you point out something that I missed that you guys get when I point out something that you might have missed. So Meg asks if she's nitpicking. In our analysis, there is no such thing as nitpicking. If it's there, we need to pick it apart. And with the Epstein list dropping soon, hopefully I'll be analyzing people like Bill Clinton and politicians who are very sophisticated liars. And when we do those analyses of sophisticated liars, we need to pick apart every single word because sophisticated liars do not lie by commission. So they never actually tell a lie. And they sometimes don't even lie by omission, where they leave stuff out. A sophisticated liar can tell you everything, but they use information treatment, which I go over in the deception deck. Certain words and phrases to treat the information they give, so to treat the truth, so that they distort it, so you don't actually get the truth, um, you get a distorted vision of the truth, and then they expect you, they rely on you to infer incorrect things and plug in the gaps that they leave out. So, you know, when a witness takes the oath before they give testimony, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Information treatment is the nothing but the truth part, right? So when you say, I swear to tell the truth, you're promising not to lie by fabrication, right? By commission, where you make something up. When you swear to tell the whole truth, you're promising not to lie by omission. So you're not going to edit or withhold information, right? So that's the second stage of lying, right? 
So the worst liars fabricate entirely. Liars who are a little bit better tell the truth, but they edit out the incriminating or sensitive parts. And then the best liars are the ones where the third part of the oath applies to, to tell nothing but the truth. So they tell you the truth, the whole truth, but then they add extra grammar and extra language and phrases, which I go over in the deception deck and which we've looked at dozens of times in these videos to treat that truth in order to distort it. So you get the wrong impression and they rely on people not to nitpick to get away with it. So, uh, there is no nitpicking when it comes to my channel, when it comes to the analysis we do here, liars, the best liars rely on you to be self-conscious about nitpicking. They need you to miss the small stuff. All right. So here we have a comment from action X, uh, the gist. And he basically talks about that crime scene. He says, for anyone who hasn't seen the crime scene, it is a real disgusting mess. Uh, but he says, but I'm confident in the fact that it truly was an accident. That is possible, right? So we don't always all have to agree. Although I do see signs of deception in the 911 call. And the deception, people don't just lie because they're guilty. So this is important. People can lie for other reasons. For example, let's say he was opportunistic. Let's say his wife did fall down the stairs and then he delayed calling 911. He stood there to make sure she died. Right? So he didn't render aid. He wanted her dead, but he was opportunistic. Like, wow, I can't believe this happened. Let me wait, make sure she's actually dead, and then I'm going to call 911 so there's no way they can save her. So that could be the deception we're seeing when he says stuff like she's still breathing or when he hesitates to answer the questions and when he's conclusive about her falling down the stairs, when if his entire story is true, there's no way he should know that conclusively that that's what happened. Right. So we have to escape binary thinking. This could be an accident and it could also be um, an opportunistic manslaughter, I guess, because he's not rendering aid. Uh, I, I don't even know how they could prosecute him. It could just be a, a legitimate accident and someone who lets someone die by, by not rendering aid, by simply not doing anything. Maybe negligence is what you could pin him for. All right, and then we have Smarty X who actually went through the checklist um, point by point, which is what I was hoping people would do, and she has lots of great notes. So, for example, Smarty X notices – when he says she is still breathing, that is extra info. My wife's had an accident. She fell down the stairs. That is blaming the victim. And it is extra information as opposed to, I think my wife had an accident or my wife needs help. So notice how Smarty said almost exactly what the innocent 911 caller said about his wife in the first video we analyzed without ever having seen that video. Because that is simply how an honest person would speak. They would hedge their statement because they don't know what happened. So I think my wife had an accident, or I think um, my wife fell down the stairs, or I think someone attacked my wife, or even just my wife needs help, right? My wife is bleeding. And that just is a great indicator of how reliable the deception detection we do here is because you can anticipate what an innocent person would say without even seeing an example of an innocent person. Just by going through the checklist and seeing what, an, what would line up with an innocent person with no guilty knowledge and what would line up with a guilty person. All right, so who is the call about? Um, she says she can't see any red flags that stand out there. And I think we found one or two in our analysis um, where... He wasn't requesting help for the victim, something along those lines. Let's see. So who is the call about? Here, he he doesn't deny the death. He accepts her death. Or actually, no, he doesn't. Um, so the victim's survival is not necessarily the priority here. But yeah, she's right. There's no huge red flags in that section, which is also why... Um, 
why I say that this is a good call to kick off this series, or at least to be the second installment in the series, because it is debatable, right? Even I don't have all my poker chips stacked up that he's guilty, but there are signs that this was not a legitimate emergency and that he might have known more than what he was saying. All right, so how was the call made? Um, so he did have a lot of politeness, so it failed the urgency test. And then he is reticent. All right, so, and then she correctly points out it qualifies for the top three guilt markers, and he missed the top innocent indicator, red flag, lie detected. So that's great. So of all the the things that we see here, there are the top three. If you remember, you can go in here and, and look at this or just screenshot this if you're just watching the video. Um, one, two, and three, biggest signs for guilt. And then urgent urgency is the biggest sign of innocence. So he fails the top three, and he fails the top innocence indicator. And then finally, Joanna Holy Life, thank you for being a member. And thank you, Smarty, for being a member and everyone who's commented for being a member of the channel. And she correctly points out that this case has lots of similarities to the Patsy Ramsey case. So if you haven't watched that video, I suggest checking it out. How to Analyze a Kidnapping, where we look at the 911 call that Patsy Ramsey made. And we also analyze the kidnapping note. Uh, that uh, the, the alleged ransom note for John JonBenet Ramsey. And that's also in this playlist. You can find the playlist in the pinned comment below. Until next time, stay true.